Hello. <laughs> um, hello, John Hoffman. What hello, Alexa here? Young. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else who's joining us, we're so glad you're here today for this very special uh, meeting with the incredible, amazing, and incredible, like delightfully handsome, sorry to objectify you um, right here. <laughs> Number one, call human resources right away. Um, and so, so happy to be here with you and thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Um, thank yes. you for doing this. I should oh, please. get out of the gate. I want everyone get out of to town. do this. Alexa All right. and I have been friends for a very, very long time and adore each other. So this is like my dream to get to hang out with Alexa for a good hour and with all of you, but um, it really means a lot that she's doing this. So I want- Oh, to know well, that. I would say we both know where the bodies are buried in, in each other's lives. So, <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about you. I want to just talk about a little bit of background for those of you who don't know John, but I'm sure everyone does because that's why you're here. So John Hoffman is the co-creator and showrunner of Only Murders in the Building, a Hulu original series starring Steve Martin, Martin Short, Selena Go Gomez. In total, get this, the show has garnered four Emmy Awards and 28 Emmy nominations. That's a lot. 12 Golden Globe nominations, three PGA nominations, four WGA nom nominations, seven SAG nominations, seven Critics' Choice Award nominations, a Peabody Award nomination, that's fancy, as well as the AFI Award for TV Program of the Year in 2024. That's all very exciting. It's Think about it. Cool. One show, all of that love, all that talent. Um, Previously, John served as an executive producer, writer, and director for six seasons of Grace and Frankie, starring Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin on Netflix. Before that, he was co-executive producer and writer for the acclaimed HBO series Looking, starring Jonathan Groff and Russell Tovey. Emmy nominated for his writing work on the 2009 Academy Awards, Hoffman has also developed for ABC, NBC, Fox, and Showtime, as well as three pilots for HBO. For his four, first film, Northern Lights, Hoffman co-wrote based on his original play, which I would just like to add, I was at every performance of, uh, which was produced and co-starred with Diane Keaton. He then went on to make his writing directing feature debut with a successful MGM Jim Henson Studios family film, Good Boy. John is also an actor. He made his Broadway debut in the Tony nominated Well by Lisa Crone. His TV credits include HBO's The Larry Sanders Show, NBC's Carol and Company, as well as series role, regular roles on Fox's Fortune Hunter, and most infamously, <laughs> The Mad Hatter oh, shit. on there we go. episode <laughs> of the Disney Channel musical series Adventures in Wonderland. Um, and he was born in Brooklyn and raised in Ohio. He graduated with a BFA from theater from Haas. Hofstra University. So that let us all welcome John. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. Hello. Hello. That was pretty cool, huh? That was a <laughs> lot of me. And I don't make a lot of sense. I really yeah, don't. That, yeah, but you that, do because you're, well, you are extremely multifaceted, but <laughs> you, I mean, you come at it from all sorts of incredible angles and um i'm now i'm just now i'm just pontificating but all of it does make sense and in fact maybe at the end of our day today we could get john to sing fever um <laughs> very good <laughs> okay not really no nope. pressure i've nope. gone off i've gone off the rails already all right <laughs> so should. john tell us how you broke into the tv world where did you get your start and what led you to this collaboration and co-creation of Only Murders in the Building with Steve Martin? <sighs> That's a good question and I love it from you. Okay, so um, I, like you, Alexa Young, started out in the theater and um, Alexa and I did summer stock together many years in a row and many other productions together. Uh, she was a fantastic Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors, by the way. I was in that production as well, but she stole it. And then, 
after theater, I, I sort of moved to Los Angeles because I was trying to be an actor in good things. And I ended up in things that were com complicated and, and, and I kept on writing and I thought, well, maybe I could write something for myself as an actor. I brought this show out uh, from New York called Northern Lights. That was what you were describing. Then it developed into screenplay. I worked for many, many years, then segueing back and forth between acting and writing and screenwriting. And I, I was doing okay as a screenwriter uh, for many, many years, always intimidated by television, actually. And the likes of someone like my dear friend, Alexa Young, who was in a room for Friends um, for many, many years. And I thought, I'm not... Uh, quite like the joke person. And I had in my head that I would like flop completely uh, pitching jokes uh, in a room. And so I, I resisted uh, trying to sort of get work in TV for a while. And also because I was getting screenwriting work for many, many years. And I was kind of learning how to write and the process of structure and the process of, at that time, you know, hour and a half, two hour storytelling. So I only got into television through pretty late, actually, with um, uh, an, an invitation from sort of HBO and uh, Michael Lannon and Andrew Haig on Looking. Um, and that was uh, HBO I had worked in development uh, with for many, many years. So they knew me well enough to know. And I thought, OK, that feels a little more like sort of in the speed of something that might make me feel comfortable. And, and it was a dream job. I loved it for two seasons and wished it gone had gone more but I thought well that might be my only tv uh job and that will be okay and um but it, if it wasn't for one Alexa Young um <laughs> again, this you're pivotal this is so true but it yeah. is very true I would not I wouldn't and I get emotional in a way talking about it because Honestly, you're looking at the woman who is responsible for me doing only murders in the building, truthfully, because if it hadn't been for Grace and Frankie, which Alexa was working on, uh, that was uh, something that she talked to Marta Kaufman and Howard Morris about me. And I met with them and I, I after looking was canceled, I there was a job and um, on Grace and Frankie. And so I thought, well, I, I feel nervous to do it, but as long as Alexa's there, I know I have a friend in that room and and she made that entree into that world very comfortable for me, um, even though there were rocky moments, but uh, it was a, I, well, a great learning process and, she, and you were amazing through that. And during that time, I learned so much from Alexa, from Marta and Howard and that great room of people and um, an incredible time on set actually with Jane and Lily mm -hmm. um, and Sam and Martin and, and, everyone on that show and it got me very comfortable again with even I directed a film as you were mentioning before so I knew set life pretty well um, but all of that teed up an invitation from Dan Fogelman and Jess Rosenthal who were working on the Paramount lot and and I had known Jess for a while he had been my longtime manager Rosalie Swedland's assistant oh, wow. years, years ago yeah so he was we had a re-meet, a reunion meeting. And shortly thereafter, I got a call saying, would you want to meet with Steve Martin to talk about a show set in New York based on an idea he has? Mm. And I said, well, you don't say no to that. And I was intimidated, but I was met by this lovely, generous person in Steve Martin. And I brought ideas to the table and he said, oh, I love those. Let's do this. And, and so we were suddenly co-creating together. And that was really how everything then spun out from there. And so it's been like a dream ride from that point on. What so, do you, um, what, first of all, I, I appreciate the things you're saying, but John dropped into that room and was instant. I mean, it was a good group of really talented people, but you just had a feel for it and I think those ladies love you in a very special way. <laughs> um, oh, I do too. I love them. Yeah. Jane and yeah, Lily no, are, are, are I mean, like, that was a life you, changer. Yeah. You embodied it and and made it yours and brought so much to the show. And you were there much longer than I was. But do you can you just tell me, tell us a little bit about what that um initial meeting was like in terms of like for all of for all of the people out there who are thinking about 
what do I do? How do I manage it? What do I, how do I approach somebody? And like, what, what did you, did you know about his idea before you came in or was it a kind of impromptu thing or, you know, just, just so curious about what it felt like and, and how you, how you got yourself there. That's such a good question. And I honestly, it, there's sometimes it does, and, and I know this isn't helpful to someone like, as far as what do I do? Because I, sometimes I don't know very well what to do or what to tell someone to do other than be open, be prepared for, you know, the lucky moment, honestly. And the lucky moment came in this invitation, but the invitation was specific to Steve's idea, which was three people who are interested in true crime um, live in an apartment building in New York City and go about investigating a murder that happens in their building together. And from there, it was my sort of task to go and meet with Steve with other ideas to sort of add to that, mold it a little bit, you know, in a way. Um, and, and the truth is I got that email while parking on Larchmont Boulevard um, and I got a spot. And so I was like, oh good, I have a spot because that's hard to get on Larchmont Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't get out of the car and I didn't take my foot off the brake light. And I just got the email and I started writing notes on my phone mm -hmm. off of just that description. And I had, it was like a sort of eruption of ideas. And you know, that's a good sign when, yeah. when you feel like the ideas start rolling very quickly. I had always wanted to make a show in New York. I knew that I've been saying it for many years. Yes. I have been obsessed with pre-war apartment buildings in New York for many, many years. So everything about this idea and the dream of working with Steve Martin, and it was floated that Martin Short was probably involved too. The whole thing, just all of a sudden, that wasn't intimidating in that moment, surpassing the flow of ideas. Uh -huh. And I just had this number of ideas a la, I think, a podcast, um, if Marty is a director and Steve is an actor, that's a great way to sort of get the best of the two of them together. Who is that third person um, that could be surprising? All of these ideas sort of kept on sort of coming pretty quickly. And I went into Jess and Dan and just sat down and, and sort of spewed them out. But the other thing that happened, honestly, um, that might help, um, was I was also dealing with a very personal loss and a, and a personal experience within the year before uh, a friend of mine had died. And there was, it was a, an odyssey, a year long odyssey for me, unlike anything I'd experienced in my life where I had to know what happened to him. It was a childhood friend and, and I had grown distant from him and I had to know what happened to him. So I was investigating and going to Wisconsin and going to meet his wife, ex-wife and his two kids and, 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 and investigating, talking to journalists in, in Wisconsin about this death to find out what was his life that led to this moment uh, of he was murdered. Um, so that was an interesting experience, but not something I thought valuable for a half hour comedy with Steve Martin and Martin Short to share, but I ended up sharing it with Dan Fogelman and Jess Rosenthal in my first meeting to be the guy who's going to co-create with Steve Martin. And I thought, oh, I'm thinking myself. And I got the exact opposite reaction from Dan. And I think that speaks so highly of him, as I can only say unbelievable things about him and his great generosity in this whole experience with the show and his brilliance. Um, but the surprise for me was his embrace of the deeper stuff and um, sharing uh, the truth about this experience with him. He said, you have to share that. <laughs> you have to share that when you pitch this with Steve to Hulu. And I was like, well, that's a terrible idea. Um, and again, he was more correct. So I would say that's one helpful thing is to sort of don't be afraid to share the most personal things sometimes if they connect to the story in some way, it really becomes the thing that holds a center. When you're having the task of creating episode after episode after episode of a show to always have this sort of inner compass of why you're doing it and what compels your characters, 
and what connects to the sort of bigger themes of your show. Um, and that that really was my biggest lesson from that moment. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Um, it's just so powerful and such a good thing to remind ourselves of that, you know, that you're bringing that piece of yourself is exactly, I think, I think one of the things that's so beautiful about the show is that the grief and the urgency of finding out what's happening to people is, it is palpable. It's not superficial. And so, you know, like what you're describing is a really good lesson for all of us in terms of not being afraid to bring ourselves to stuff. So I'm so glad you did that too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, it's really true. I, I didn't have that connection that I thought I would have until I sort of made that equation or when telling that story, I realized, oh, I can do that. It also gave me confidence. You know, you sort of know it in your bones. The question is, will people accept it? You know, will people want that? as part of their comedy show and as part of, you know, and, but I think also the thing that happened with our show is that we, we were making it deep in the early days of the pandemic. And then we were on while the pandemic was still happening. And it's a show that is built around three very lonely people isolated in their own apartments and suddenly worried about what happens when they step out into their hallway and could they be murdered by someone down the hall? And you, that, that is something we could never have planned on being something that was in the feelings of people who were home and wondering if they could go outside and all of that. And so the show kind of had a bit of a matched, uh, quality to the feelings that we had all been experiencing in those years. So I just think, there was a comfort with the people involved in the show, having Selena, who have, you know, a whole generation feels this great warmth and, and heart towards, and, and Steve and Marty and another generation and the beautiful mix of that. But I think ultimately, too, underneath it was a show that made people feel, I don't know, connected or seen and, and uh, understood uh, the, what was what was happening in it. And then being able to laugh on top of all of that was very, um, it was very gratifying to make, make people laugh during that time. I know a lot of people who feel like that sh your show had helped them get through the pandemic, you know, it was like truly mm -hmm. like your friends or your family and the, who's the people in your living room are, you know, you get, you're along for that ride, you know, talking about that kind of incredible chemistry and timing, how did you kind of then move forward with that in terms of like you've had three incredibly successful seasons and i'm you know we're fourth let's make it the fourth right now or we're, yeah. we're getting ready to going yeah, yeah. so yeah. let's just you know but i'm so curious about what like how you know you can't you the first two seasons had a particular kind of approach and then you got more musical and like, I'm curious how you carried that once you, it sounds like what you're saying is, I'm sorry, I'm taking up too much space. It sounds like what you're saying is that that was a sort of like unexpected uh, gift of of the pandemic. But then how did you then like move forward and think about people coming out of their homes? And was that part of how you broke those seasons? Such a great, again, a beautiful question. Like, no, I think, uh, you know, always for me is is like, the story and the characters and 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 there's a beautiful like I feel an access point to all each of our trio um and and so that helps me sort of orient myself as to the stories that I think we could tell um our show is very unique um in tonal shifts obviously and um being a comedy that's also a mystery that runs across 10 episodes um, I've written mystery films before, but, you know, most of, most stories you write are mysteries, I guess, because you're always hiding things, you're always revealing things, but, but this is particular, a 10 episode single mystery you're working on that has to, one of the Steve's requirements at the beginning was we need to have the answer at the end of every season. I don't want it to sort of be ambiguous. I want it to sort of give the audience that pleasure of knowing that's the answer. So I love that requirement, but it also, I wasn't prepared for the challenges that uh, making a comedy show 
that could also hold the audience of true crime fans and and mystery watchers uh, and and be deeply sort of twisty and 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 keep people on their toes uh, throughout or at least invested in wondering and then being surprised and shocked. All of that was it's it's a real I, I credit so much this brilliant writing team that works on this show. Dan and Jess as well, and everyone who is all in to make it sort of really come together. It's it's quite a task though. And um, I say only to look at like, you know, the first season, Mabel is connected to the victim. And that was a real personal, that was, I sort of took my own experience and handed it to the character of Mabel and watched her sort of process in the way that I had been processing. Charles has deeper feelings about his father and and also what he'd been through at the end of season one with being sort of in a relationship with the ultimate killer. Spoiler, everyone forget that if you haven't watched. And then you get into uh, season three, which felt like it was well-timed to be sort of Oliver's uh, swing and, and both romantically, which we hadn't done with him, and we found a terrific like young actress to come in and have a love interest as a love interest for Marty. And she, I think she's she's really got a big future. I don't know how the hell that happened. I don't it, I still don't believe it happened that Meryl it's Streep. Great. Did the show. It's so good. But then it just feels a little miraculous when you're in it and you get great support. Honestly, this show has gotten such great support from it's rare air I'm in with the support from Hulu and Disney and everybody in 20th that works on this thing. They've just come along and said, there's something special here. They've said yes to all the things that were potentially odd and other places might say, why does it have to, you know, have surreal touches? Um, all of that. They were just embracing of the whole thing and that helped immeasurably and sort of taking leaps like a musical season um, or not, you know, I, I, I knew that we had to still remain our show but incorporating theater and a theatrical experience and music in the way that we did in, in season three is one of the things I feel most proud of because the challenges were numerous and the support came and the brilliant writing of those music songs. I could not, I mean, it is a joke who wrote. It is Pasek and Paul at the center of this creating with me as we were sort of like working out our stories and finding songs that made sense for our narrative so it didn't feel just over here for our own, you know, delightful love of musicals and whatever. It felt very organically a part of it. And then they brought along, they invited along Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman and Sarah Bareilles and Michael R. Jackson. And it became like this thing that, I don't know, the show is a big magnet for amazing talent. And to have a season where all that was going on and you have Meryl Streep and Paul Rudd for a whole season in your show, just being the most delightful people and brilliant artists, it's like, I'm done. I don't know what else I've gotten me, but I'm, I've got a season four coming that also thrills me. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited. This, this, I'm, I'm surprised that the show feeds the creative spirit in the vivid way it has so far, but and I, I am constantly surprised that, oh God, there's another one, there's another one, and the ideas keep coming. So, so far, so good for me. As oh, far as for sure. Own. And I'm, you know, I would say knowing you a little bit, that a lot of that is a kind of a, a, an, a tone and an environment that you create, which is very, um, it's, I mean, obviously you're the person in charge and you make the decisions, but you, you know, because you come from the theater and you're really collaborative, I would imagine you were, there was a real flow that goes on. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit, working with that caliber of performers and then now, and then you're getting into the musical theater collaboration and just be so interesting for us to hear about how that works and, you know, maybe what's great and sometimes what's challenging and how you negotiate all of that. I love that. Oh, Alexa, this is so sweet to talk to you about this stuff. Okay, so here's the thing. Alexa knows me and she brought up two credits and this may help. Um, she brought up two credits of mine from when I was much younger um, and they are uh, we, our, our summer stock experience um, that we shared together. We lived in a house together, Alexa and I. We got very, very 
down and dirty about all of it back then in the days when we were kicking up and starting up, having the best time. And when we first got to know each other, and that was also a, a theater, the Depot Theater, uh, was a place where I was able to develop my first bit of writing. And it was a, a play, it had music that Janine Tesori arranged and, and wrote for us. Um, and uh, that, that experience at the same time, very similarly, shortly after that was when I was on this very odd children's show on the Disney Channel for a hundred episodes where we were doing musical numbers, four of them an episode, and doing heavy book comedy scenes. And a lot of it was, we had to work to self-generate blocking and self-generate sort of stuff that, you know, uh, choreography and, and, and moments within those comedic moments. It was like a real workout for everyone in that show. And we all are great friends still to this day um, from that show because it was like, unlike any other acting um, job in, in television, it was peculiar. Um, but what a lesson. And I tell you, when I got to doing season three of Only Murders in the Building, those two experiences as a foundational thing for me made me feel very confident and assured that um, I knew how to do this. I knew how to bring musical numbers uh, integrated within stories. I knew how to help choreograph and stage and block. I directed the first two episodes. I, I, I felt an assurance about how we could organize ourselves on the production side in a way that I probably shouldn't have. But this is just to say, it, any experience that you had as writers, um, you know, it could be out of your own garage when you were 10 doing your show. You never know what little lessons, what embedded things are happening back then that actually will come into great use um, later on because I needed that. And I, I don't know that I would have been able to sort of like pull off the way I think we did in, in that last season those things without feeling that assurance of some experience that you could never get uh, without just sort of like doing crazy things back in your early days. And, and, and there we were. So it, it greatly benefited, I think the process, but that that's where it all started truthfully. And then, and then after that, you just get a tremendous amount of help um, on these television shows and I have to say, as, as I like a I like a really nice set. I don't I don't do well. I don't work well unless everyone's happy and kind. So that that is luckily the way Selena Gomez, Steve Martin, and Martin Short like it too. So that's an important thing. Um, that is very important actually for me, and I think for the world. Um, but the other thing that's there is you make. You know this, Alexa. You make hundreds of decisions in this job every hour, it feels like. And you have to be the person who makes those decisions. You have to have the answer for it. And if you don't enjoy that process, that's something to look at and ask yourself. Sometimes you find your way to it. It's not always the most enjoyable thing for me. However, I also know right back there because I know what I do to sort of with the writers and helping to shape these stories and helping to craft with Dan and Jess what we want the show to be, that there isn't another better person to be answering those questions than me. So I like it that way too. And you have to feel a certain, I think it's helpful to like being the one who answers the questions. And and, and that's a key thing I've recognized. It's not always comfortable. And sometimes you say no more than you're comfortable, but to answer them uh, and to feel like, oh no, I'm the one, who else is, no one No one should answer that but me. <laughs> and I kind of know that if it's, it's not out of ego, it's simply out of organization and that we're all making the same show together. So it helps that immensely. And, and so that, that's, a, that's a task I've learned a lot and and also um, uh, found you know at times challenging, but in good ways. Um, you know, 
talking about that, I, there's two thoughts I have. One is that part of why you probably have that equilibrium and you you know your north, south, east, west is because you're a performer. So in addition to your sort of top-down skills, you know how to get at something from the inside out. So mm -hmm. that's what makes you a great director and a, a person that can really like communicate and collaborate with the the actors that you're dealing with. But that's a lot of hats. Like you're wearing a ridiculous amount of hats on your show. And um, I'm just, you know, uh, not to not to get nitty gritty, but like for people that are navigating, uh, and I know, I really know that you've had wonderful support and people really have believed in what you're doing and you created that, but anybody that's trying to navigate a new show on an, you know, like that, there's a lot of mountains to climb and a lot of voices. And so my, my question is, how do you stay true to what you're, what you know, and how do you, I, you know, how do you not lose yourself if you're a person who is collaborative and doesn't just say like, oh, we'll look at that, which really means like piss off. How do you <laughs> find yourself, you know? How do you like keep it, like how do you do that? And lead, and lead. <laughs> yeah, right, of course. And and that's great. And I will say, uh, I did play the Mad Hatter on that television show that I talked about for a hundred episodes. So all of the hats I'm wearing today, that is also training ground. <laughs> okay, but um, so at the, I think truthfully, I do, I do say that, you know, I've been at this a while, you know me, Alexa, and, and you know, I've, I've struggled a lot. And the truth is I had such close calls with things that were almost produced on the movie side, things that were almost produced as pilots, years and years and years of right, taking it all in my heart, being completely in, into the thing I was working on. And then we were, oh, so close. And then it doesn't happen. Um, that disappointment is a part of the business. And, and it was very challenging to get through that time. But I recognized also it, it's, it's the good fortune of working with like-minded people is really key here. You cannot do this on your own unless someone says, oh, I like that and I'm going to back it. And I recognize, honestly, I give full credit to Dan Fogelman here because this is something that I was dazzled by, truthfully, when I got to work with him. And he, he would read things and he was so expressive about his love of what I had done. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. And once he did express that love, he stayed committed to it. He didn't waver and he didn't change what he felt. He was like, no, that's great. And we're doing it. And I would bring him ideas that felt like, oh, well, now I'm going to really push it over the edge. I'm going to, you know, I'm talking about this thing. I'm going to show him this video for the pile in the pilot of Only Murders, which has like this dance piece of this guy going up these stairs and collapsing and falling and falling on a trampoline and doing all this. And I'm like, somehow I presented this video to him in development on the pilot. And I said, Dan, I want you to open up your mind here for a second. And just look at this video, but I feel like there's something in it as to the artful way Steve Martin and Martin Short have done their comedy and the sort of quality of the bounce back that happens here for people when they've been down, all of that. And I don't know what to do with it, but to me, I feel something like this has to be in the pilot in some way, but I could be crazy and you may throw me out of the office. And he watched it and he's like, it has to be, it has to be in the show. It has to be. And it's that thing that you need. Like you need the person who's helping to push it along way up there in those offices who can say, this is the guy, this is the tone, this is the thing, and I believe in it and we're going to do it. That is the greatest gift that came from this experience. And I got to flourish in my wild thoughts and ideas in some ways that I could never have been able to do. And, and I think I landed, as I said, I landed in that position fully prepared because I've been so close in so many ways over the time. So all of those experiences, I've often wondered um, if I could know my whole life at some point that like, would I, would I have traded like something happening, you know, 
earlier and getting produced earlier. And then I have a career where I've produced six television shows by now. Um, or would it have been, I'm learning the whole way, having all of these sort of disappointments and struggles in many ways to, up to this moment to have this experience. And I, I, I can't, I can't say I can control that, but I certainly feel like it's it's incredibly fortunate to be sitting here in this moment with this particular show and this experience. After all that time, it feels very sweet. It does. Um, what a beautiful way of, that's such a lovely way to uh, characterize all of it too. It's sort of like it happens, not it happens when you're ready. That sounds like pejorative in some way or blaming because lots of things happen for no good reason at all. But it sounds like one of the things you're saying is that the people around you agreed with you about what good is. Yes. You know, like yes. that seems like an like what you what you are saying. You you seem to be saying in a lot of different ways about your collaborators, your staff. You know, the support you got. So it, do you, does that resonate? Boy, does it. And and we all, and that's, you know, a lot of it has been, and, and I, I had never put together a writer's room. And so I got to sort of pick for the first time, the people in this room and, and what an experience, what a difficult experience, because I met amazing people. And then you only get to have so many, but it was, um, you know, it's like, I always, I do like throwing a party. Alexa, you know, I, I do like throwing a party. And so putting together parties, whether small or large, and like thinking about curating in that way to sort of say, oh, I think this is going to be good because I know who's coming. Oh, Alexa's coming. This person over here, the button, like you're doing that thing. So um, I, I felt good about that, but I kind of looked at it like that in some way. And, but I think you're right. I think at the bottom of it all was this feeling of like, Oh, in the writing that I was reading, I was very clear about, oh, I love the way they just took that scene from here to here. And they turned it here in this way that's elegant and funny and odd, or any of the things that are very specific to us writers of our voices. Um, but one that I could feel a great connection to or an admiration for. And so I knew that that choice was something I felt was good. And, and I could recognize, oh, they thought that too. And I, that makes me happy when I feel that inner link between people sort of, whether it's just in the way they're doing it. Um, so that's what I tried to sort of use as my compass for who I wanted in the room beyond just lovely human beings and um, a mix of experience. Opening up, we, we, we had a novelist in our room the first season we had a we had playwrights and we have you know it we I try to get a good mix of experience so it's also um from people who were excited to be there that's the other thing and here's the other thing I would say to writers out there um there is nothing more valuable and this may sound really obvious but letting people know if you're meeting on a show if you're anything like that letting someone know how much you love their show how much you would kill to work on that show. And I really mean it. Like it's, it's, it, it triggers something to me, not for my ego again. It really is only about God. You really rely so much on everybody in that room. And you, at the base of it, you want to know they want to be there and they're loving being there, even when it's hard, even when it's a struggle, even when it's like, oh, we don't have episode six, and you know, like, ah, ah, we don't have it again, ah, and you get to work and you press through those hard moments together. But as long as you have a group of people, too, that I like to sort of, I've been very happy writers rooms, I think. Um, and, 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 and if you have the people that at the core are sort of of like mind is the way they like to work and then sensibility and recognizing like the funny, that's the kind of funny that matches the show. That's the kind of funny that I haven't heard on this show, but boy, that's good and surprises me and does all those things. And we have that mind meld of looking at like, okay, that that works. And, and when we do that and feel that, that's the greatest, that's where it's also so much like 
you know, it couldn't be more collaborative in making one of these things happen. That's amazing. So I just have a couple of, a uh, few more questions, uh, but wondering, uh, there's definitely some hunger to know if you're, if you could give us any um, tips about like little, let us know any hints about what might be coming up that we can look forward to. I don't want to put you on the spot or get you in trouble with your network, but if there's anything you feel comfortable and you can bow out, I, I no pressure, just as a fan. That is so hard. Okay, that's fine. You no. don't. Know, you can pass. You can pass. <laughs> totally. No, I, I don't. don't honestly, it's all good. I, I know really there's like a whole. It. There's a whole like department that's getting ready to like you know, le like they yeah. I get it. No, but I really mean like you know what we have is the yeah. finale episode of season three, right? So right. There are things that people know if you I you know please go watch. If you haven't seen the show, it's enjoyable. I really recommend it. Okay. But beyond that, if you know the end of season three, uh, then there is a, there is a terrible um, upsetting moment at the very, very end of season three with a very beloved character. And so the part of me that's upset about all that and, uh, is the is is just on the flip side of the part of me that is very excited to spend time with that character more because that's what happens in our show. Uh, our victims get new life uh, by sort of opening up the who really is this person door. Um, and we get to explore all kinds of things that we may not have known before and connections that that character's had and worlds that open up again as we did last year with someone dying on the stage on opening night in a theater um, as long as there's the connective tissue to all of our characters that's hugely helpful in this case we have a world opening up i can't say what the world is but it's a very exciting world that's opened up by this character that's um, very exciting we, yeah. Okay, that's just enough. Thank you. Oh, good. That was very good titillating. One. Very okay. good. All right. So I just have a couple of kind of um, just wrap up y kinds of questions. And I know we have a lot of questions from all our friends out there in attendance. They've been popping up all uh, during this whole time. And I'm sort of watching them and seeing like how in like there's so i wish we could definitely do this for like a, a, all night long because you there are I, a lot of great questions from folks oh, I, I love but, that. you know one thing that i always think about is you know over a career that had like you know over your journey as doing all the amazing things you've done is is there anything you wish you could go back and tell yourself at any point in your life like i think about when you were starting out you know, or when you weren't where you wanted to be and like what you might tell yourself. And then like once you were sort of in it and maybe it was challenging and and what what would you tell yourself now? So it's a three part question. That's a good one, I think. So it's funny, you know, you and I knew each other back then, right? And so I think we were goofy right? We were really goofy and free-spirited and, but, but truthfully, we were believing in ourselves. I felt that from you, honestly, I always did. I could see that in you and I recognize it and I liked it. And I like people yeah. who believed in themselves. It's attractive. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's like, I, I feel like I learn from, from people like you and, and that like, we, we recognize each other and go, oh my God, you're fantastic. Oh my God, look what you're doing. What are you doing? I, oh, oh, this play is fantastic. I was in Alexis, one of the er earliest plays. I think the play that helped this get you my staff at Friends. This is turning yeah. into like a gross like thing, but is it yes, gross? I, I know. I hope not, but I wrote several plays for John because you were, you were like my my muse but can i also mention your your hofstra community because i feel like oh, those yeah. people who that you built, built a community with and have continued to be in your life were yeah. also a huge i think um yes. part of your your journey well that's it you know and and really we were full of ourselves there's every group i was with was confident and so my Hofstra group, there's brilliant people who have gone on from that. What my whole theater 
I majored in theater at Hofstra and I um, traveled there from Ohio, like it's really a commuter school, but I traveled to go there. But anyway, they have a great, they had a great theater department, still do. And they, but, but the people that I met there are lifelong friends and family really. And, and talented. Like I just happened to be in the mix of really talented, great people. Same thing happened with you at the Depot Theater. Same thing. Look at the wealth of enormous, like truly culture changing talents that were in that group um, and, and have had big, huge careers off of that little group in our little goofy summer stock. And the other summer stock group I had where uh, I was up in Killington, Vermont at the Green Mountain Guild, weirdly, where Meryl Streep had also been in Summerstock a couple of years before. And, but I met a group of people there, same thing, that were just their lifelong friends. Um, Lisa Crone, who gave me my Broadway debut in her first play, Well, was from that Summerstock. I think it was recognizing each other, supporting each other, uh, reading each other's works, going to see each other's plays, going to see each other's performances, laughing your butt off with them. Um, and like you and I have had our whole lives and, and sort of just being back and forth as much as possible and connected and keeping keeping connected. And, um, you know, for the really hard times and the really uh, good times. Uh, and And there are both. And there's not just a road that, you know, I think if I could tell myself something as to your question, um, it's, it's, it's that you can't, like, I think I might have gotten lost in realizing I could rely on my friends like that and, and know that they were sort of, it was not dependent upon success, that we were, we were friends first. Um, and, and that, that was the thing I sometimes felt like, oh, if I'm not successful, then no one's going to want to be my friends. <laughs> so you can get caught up in bad thinking that way. Um, but I think, you know, opening up and being vulnerable and talking about the hard stuff is, is what friends are made of truthfully, who you can do that with. And, and, uh, and that's the support that floats you along that carries you through the stuff and, and, um, and then ultimately feeds all of the work you do. Like, I mean, really, I, I mean, you end up writing your friends in your piece. You end up writing your friends' stories in your pieces, um, being inspired by the moment you heard about someone at the wedding over there, you know, and, and you find it gets synthesized and then you're sort of like, honoring in some way your friends by doing the work you're doing so all of that is how it feels to me yeah it's like when I I think back about you about that you always had a kind of self-possession and a sense of your own voice but I I don't know if you agree with this but I think that the people that you've kept around you in your life are people who tell you the truth I think there's different kinds of people in Hollywood. They're the people that get successful and then keep people around them who will tell them what they want to hear. Oh, and yeah. then there are people who have had a long history or maybe it's somebody you just met, but I I think you're somebody that is really open to hearing like potentially hard stuff or or just something you hadn't thought of from someone else. And I don't know if you feel like that's important, but um yeah absolutely absolutely and that and I I don't know why this is but I'm always delighted by a prickly comment I'm like anything that feels like critical or like wow and even like at a you know a real thing as long as it's mm -hmm. real oh I'm sorry as long as it's oh calling is it postmates I know. Shoot, no, it's 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 just my annoyance. Like I've got I'm making a television show over here. Oh God. Okay. Oh, it's all um, good. No worries. No worries. Well, that's it. I'm I'm surprised there haven't been calls before this, but this. I know um, you're doing know, so good. well. Um. Yeah. So I can't remember. I've lost my train of thought there. That's okay. No, no, no. It's all good. Um, yeah. I guess um I want to try to turn to just a couple of um questions here that are this has been a very exciting thing to 
um, see people writing about. Um, <laughs> and somebody wanted to know what you're getting from your Postmates, but um, what oh are we God. eating for dinner? Um, it's all the time. I eat like a 12 year old. I eat like a <laughs> you always old. have, by the way. Always have. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm um, like, like getting the yeah. chicken tenders and the burger. I, I'm like, put that. I know. Yeah. I know. Um, so, so, okay. So I think that what I'm seeing here is, uh, uh, there is a trend, which is, I think people are really struggling right now in terms of where we are in the business. We've all lived through this strike. Um, there's a contraction going on. There was the bubble. Now we're, and I guess, uh, I, I mean, really it's the question of how do you find, like, you sort of were answering it when you were talking about what you look for. Um, what, and, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, about if somebody wanted to get, you know, get a job, but do you, um, you know, do you, do you have thoughts about what to say to people now? It, it's a, it's a little bit of a treacherous time. And so I think we'd all be really interested to hear your take on that. Yeah, I, it is a, it is a treacherous time. And, and, and I'm so both proud of the unions and the work we did to sort of make change and come together and find community. I mean, on those lines and, and uh, the, the connections that were made and and I mean everything that came that was positive out of that experience and that we all hope bleeds out into good connections and and further work and 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 better conditions for that work um I do think it's um a combination of things because God knows it's like I wasn't always working in certain ways that I wanted to be working and so you you could only trust sort of like your own spirit of like the kinds of things you spent your time on this is a time and and I don't I, I hope it's helpful but I know it's obvious too but like I do think there is great value you and I come from a place of like you do the thing you have to do on your own sometimes and right now this is a very DIY sort of like there's great access and there's great ways for your work to be done, created without waiting for someone to hire you and give you that um, opportunity. And you all should have that opportunity. But I know myself, every time I got caught in caught up in my head of waiting for someone out there to give me the thing or to why isn't that person reach? And why am I not getting that? Why am I? Any of those thoughts, it's a real, it's a real battle in 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 the psyche, I think, of 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 writers, creators, artists, um, to really remember to turn that mirror back and go, what do I want to say? What do I want to do? How can I do it? Right now, there's much more access to sort of let that voice be heard. Um, and any ways in which reach out, get help from people in those moments, in the downtimes, in the in-between sustain as much as you can on the in-between. That's the creative answer. And then as someone who has hired and is hiring at various times, I look to expand the rooms and expand the opportunities to people who haven't had that. And so any that I, I can only say there's nothing more sweet than hiring someone who has been doing that DIY thing over there and had their voice is clear as it presents itself and it's like they're ready to go and so i i feel like that's the thrill um of being able to give opportunity that way so it's all about being prepared for that opportunity and simultaneously living a life that allows you if as much as you can to let your artistry come forth and be be a voice of 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 the kind of thing you want to be doing and there's real ways in which you can do it. I, I remember, stu uh, uh, like, I remember thinking, like, when I was at a loss as to what to do. Sometimes it's very, uh, back in the day, back in the year, I probably said this to you, Alexa, this is like, my, my, one of these lessons, I read one of these books, it was a self-help book. But the thing that helped me the most about this was, was this idea that was very simple, which was, if I thought about where I wanted to be, it felt so far away and I didn't know how the hell to get there. 
And I had to reorient my thinking and sort of go from the furthest point and kind of like building a mystery series. Each season, you have to go to who was the killer? How did they do it? Answer that and then work your way backwards to how do we hide that and create 10 episodes that are interesting up to yeah. that point. Um, this is where I want to be out there feels so unattainable and it's exhausting to imagine. And I it's like a big magic mystery that I can't understand how people got there and how do I get there? If you work your way back logically and kind of like make a little chart back to where you're ending in a little bubble that means buy envelopes, and you get down to the most simple tasks, these are the things you can do tomorrow. And then you're actively looking at like, I bought the envelopes today. What's the next bubble on that chart that takes me, I know I'm on a path that could get me there, but it's a task I can do. It's accessible, it makes me feel good. I'm doing something every day for the ultimate goal. And I can look at it and go, that's a way there. That was really helpful to me it's a very simple idea but i don't know it 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 makes it you know you're just looking for the way to sort of make the dream accessible in a real way at times i love the idea that you know part of what it sounds like you're saying is like somebody once said to me that hollywood replicates the most dysfunctional aspects of our family life so a lot of times we feel like we're like this little baby, like reaching up, like pick me up. And then you just feel terrible because it's not happening. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is like, keep working. This does not solve the question of like, how do I pay my rent? But I know when I started out, the only thing anybody wanted to read was two specs of a show that already existed. And it sounds like there's a hunger for original material for people who are asking and that you're somebody that looks at all sorts of interesting things that might not be two specs from a show that already exists, you know, in terms yeah. of like people are asking how might they get a job, you know, on your show, but it sounds like you've, you've been answering that all along, which is that you're looking for a voice and for ingenuity and openness. And I don't know, keep talking, tell me more. <laughs> That's so right. And I really mean it. Like I, I've thought about that. I've never read a spec script for Only Murders in the Building. And I'm nervous to, and I wouldn't, honestly. I, I'm very intrigued by going to a piece of theater in New York, going to a piece of theater in LA, going, you know, and seeing someone's new work or, or reading someone's pilot on, you know, what, what is that idea? You know, and then you're like, okay, what uh, that's fascinating and of course you should work on only murders in the building because listen to you look at you and, and and all of that so that that's what i get excited about honestly is is just the wild creativity i find is out there everywhere um and yet you know it i think you find your way to be um is ben smith in here i just saw that name come up here ben smith is it's so funny ben smith are you in here i hope he is um Ben Smith should be everywhere, but anyway, okay. Uh, but he's my, he's, he's, uh, anyway, hi, Ben Smith. Is he here? Okay. Anyway, anyway, I don't know if he's here, but he's, he's one of the essential people on Only Murders in the Building in the writer's room and, uh, and along with everybody else, but, uh, it's nice if he is, but yeah, I give big props to Ben. Um, that's so nice. So, okay. I want to, um, <laughs> Uh, I hope that I've covered some of the questions. Um, I, I wish I could ask all of them of you, but I guess my question is, is there anything that you, that we've left on the table that like when you were driving or, or you don't drive in New York, when you're walking around in New York, you're like, Hey, when I do that panel, I kind of want to talk about X. Like, are there any X's that you would like to leave us with? Sure. Um, there are many ways and many times, I mean, I guess this, I, I wasn't thinking about it while walking around New York. It just hit me now. So, uh, but I've recognized That's that. This, yeah. I mean, in this experience, um, this show has been a show that has introduced me and, and, and allowed me to work with just incredible people, obviously. And there were moments where I felt very intimidated and very um, nervous to sort of step up. And there was like one side of that that could be debilitating 
and then the other side that just opened it up and felt like, okay, I don't know how this is going to go. As long as I can get the end result out of my head, I want to have a good time. And and maybe it's all of this time that it took to get here. Um, but but I think that's one thing I would say. Just there are ways in which you like can be intimidated at times by the people in the process and everything else and all of those people that you admire and work with and work for. Um, but recognize the simple humanity. Um, recognize we all wake up and do the same dumb things and we all are equal sort of life experienced people um and and that helps me recognize that i'm talking to a human who is same frustration with like why is this toothbrush doing this in the morning um and and anything like that you know that's very simple it just makes it i was i found myself constantly hanging on and then being confronted once i could deal with people in a very simple way and not have it be, I have to be something for this experience or for them with their huge careers and all of that. I think if I just took it in terms of like, wait, what's going on with you? And you hear about, you know, their dog hurt their leg that day. And then you're like, okay, I'm in. Now I'm talking about something that I can connect with and I'm having that experience. So once you realize we're all just human as well, it takes a lot of um, the pressure off of uh, the intimidation factor and the, can I do it? Can I step it up? I do think it's really, the, their dead cat is in the freezer. Mandy, yes. Sometimes you have to say, I'm going to give Steve Martin a script where he's going to get a dead cat in a freezer. And you have to feel confident about that. And you have to know that like, <laughs> he, will, he will enjoy that. That's a bold move. Yeah, it is a bit of a bold move. And I, you have to be bold. Um, so yeah, no one saved the cat. I know it's sad about the cat. But, um, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time, John. And a big shout out to Gabe, who has been uh, working very hard. And we're, we hope we didn't overlap too much um, for you. Um, and um, uh, I don't suppose you want to sing Fever or anything. No. Oh God! I know I don't have that upper note. <laughs> that was I know Jesus. I, that was, I wasn't go. that part of Northern Lights. Didn't it wasn't was. she? So you guys, what what this piece was was a piece, beautiful, beautiful piece that um, John wrote, where he played. How many characters did you play in that thing? I think it was eight characters. Yeah, yeah. Like this extraordinary transformation into eight characters, one of whom sang "Fever." which I remember never, like I had never seen anything like it. And um, <laughs> so anyway, we're all so glad you're here and you're making oh. such beautiful art. And thank you for your time. Let's and, get a hand for Alexa Young, please. And for too, everyone who came to me. hang out with us. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you again. And we cannot wait for season four. Thank so, you. Alexa, right. you're the best. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I love this foundation. Thank you.